tonight I'm going to be talking about a portion of construction of a Hubble palette image, and that is tone mapping. Uh, this is the image that we're going to be talking about, and a little bit later in the presentation, I'll put up a link to the actual image on AstroBIM, which is what you see. So you probably have all done narrowband imaging. Uh, mostly it's done in, it, well, it, it has more interesting structures. And for those that are in light polluted areas like we are here in Chicago, you know, narrowband imaging is the kind of thing that we can do and not worry about the light pollution. So the Hubble palette image is a way to present the three primary emissions that we collect, the hydrogen alpha, the H, the sulfur S and oxygen uh, three. And they are mapped to the RGB color palette. They're mapped where sulfur is R, hydrogen is G and oxygen is, is B. And there's oftentimes a question of like, why are they mapped that way? Well, in the first place, when you get done, you get a really pretty image. Uh, but the reason before that was that it starts with the longest wavelength and the longest wavelength is actually the sulfur emission. So that would naturally be R. Hydrogen is next, even though it's kind of a, a lighter version of red. So that's going to be green and oxygen, which is blue green is going to be blue. So that is the mapping system for the Hubble palette. And by the way, any space telescope image that you see, they are all mapped images. They don't, even the ones that have images in visible light, they don't have RGB filters like we do. They have a whole variety of filters and they have to map them to a spectrum that we can see, which is the RGB spectrum. And especially if you have images that are in the infrared or the ultraviolet, or even further out, you must map them to a color that you can see. So this is the Hubble palette mapping. And the final image that we see here is a balancing of those three. The problem is that most of these emission nebulas, which this one is, are primarily containing hydrogen. So the emissions that you get are primarily hydrogen. And if you map that to green, then your image is going to be green, of course. So you have to have a way of balancing that. And this balancing system is what I'm going to discuss tonight. And we're going to discuss a slightly revised method of, method of balancing. I think if you've done a Hubble palette image, you've actually seen this before you go in, you adjust your histogram and now you have your image. But I think it's more complex than that, where you have to actually adjust different areas of the image individually by selection in order to get the most out of the image. Now we're going to start, this is the starting images that I'm going to work with in order to produce the tone map. And we are going to work with a tone map, that is a map of the colors without the stars. And if you haven't heard before, the reason we do this is that we have to stretch these images. And even the images you see here, the oxygen and the sulfur have already been stretched. And if I were going to be working with images that had stars in them, those stars would get bigger. And even if we're, we have a way of working around not stretching the stars, it can get very complex. And I'm sure that you have seen Hubble palette images where the stars have purple halos around them. Well, you get around that problem by working with starless images. And these are all generated in PixInsight, and this is what we're going to start with. But if you put them together, I've already said that, if you put them together, you end up with an image that kind of looks like the one in front of you on the lower right. It's green. It's green because hydrogen is the primary emission. And most any nebula, emission nebula you work with, if you just put the hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen together, it's going to be green. But we can do a better job than that. We can go through this adjustment in different parts of the image and end up with something that I call multi-level tone mapping, which you'll see in just a moment. So let's get started. Let me stop this one. And bring up Photoshop. 
So this is the same image that you saw just a moment ago. It's green. It's green because if you look at the hydrogen emission, that is the stronger emission. And even if I partially stretch the sulfur and the oxygen, it's still green. So we have to make an adjustment of that. And I'm gonna do this step by step. And we're gonna do it with layers. This is the layers palette right here. So let me make a new layer. Let's drag this down. Now, instead of adjusting the whole image at once, you can see clearly that there's different amounts and different colors emission in different parts of, of this image. Even if it's not balanced, you can see that there's more hydrogen in some areas, more sulfur in others, and more oxygen in other areas. So let's make adjustment in specific areas based on lightness. And I'm gonna do this with the selection tool. So let's just select this area. And we don't have to be real fine with this selection. Ah, oh, see, that's very jiggly. Not to worry, because we're going to make this selection, and now we're going to feather it. Modify, feather, and let's feather it really broadly with 400 pixels. So now we have an area which is approximately equal in lightness. I'm going to hide the little marching ants. I don't like those are chants. But the selection is still there, and I'm going to go into the Levels command, Adjustment, Levels, and I'm going to go through the R, G, and B channels and try to balance them. And I usually work with just the left and the center slider, and you see the histogram changes as I move it. And now we're looking for areas that are overlapping, so now the red is overlapping more of the green. This is part of the balancing technique. The green, now uh, you can see how broad that is. Let's, yeah, let's leave it about there. And the blue. So we're trying to get as much overlap in these as we can. And you see what we've done for just this area. We now have a more varied color area, just the one that we've selected than it was before. We can see before and after, and not so dominated by hydrogen alpha. We have balanced that area so that the sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen alpha are approximately the same. Not great, but approximately. So now let's make another layer. Let's drop that down. And let's make another selection. Let's make this selection over here, this kind of brownish area. And again, we don't have to be too fine with this. Make that selection. We're going to feather that selection. Let's make a nice broad feather again. Hide those marching ants. There we go. And now go in in the levels command and balance that. Now, in the beginning, these outside darker selections aren't as dramatic, but once we get into the center, you'll see that there is truly a dramatic change. But you can see we have, can make some adjustments here to kind of overlap the R, G, and B so it is more balanced. And let's do this starting with red. A quick question from Linda on YouTube. Sure. Um, did you do a linear fit on your three color channels uh, no, I don't do this? linear fit because linear fit is problematic and there are different kinds of linear fits. Now I'm going to try to do two things at once and none of them are perfect. What you can do and what I usually do is I simply stretch the image. So for the sulfur and the oxygen, I'm trying to do two things at once. So now I've, I've got it overlap. Uh, let me, I'll get back to that question in a second. But you can see that we've got more variation in that one selection. So let's implement that. Yeah, linear fit, I've used it in Photoshop. I use it more to balance the background for an RGB image, like for a galaxy. But just doing linear fit here really does not produce the results that you want. You're better off just doing initial stretching of the starless image. But I understand the question. So here we get a nice overlap. We have one more not too exciting area to do. 
I'm going to make a copy. And we're going to select this area down here. And we're going to selection, modify, feather. Nope. Missed it. Selection, modify, feather. Uh, let's do a 300. Now, the amount that I feather this depends on the size of the selection. So the smaller the selection area, the less I feather it, since we don't want to have the feather overlap to other areas that we've already adjusted. But we don't want to have nice, sharp boundaries, which are also undesirable. Hide those marching ants. And this is getting a little redundant, isn't it? But don't worry, you spent 8, 12, 14 hours collecting data over three or four nights. So this only takes really a few minutes and easy to do. We're going to broaden out that histogram. Now, you can see that the overlap isn't perfect, but watch what happens when we get to the end of this process in just a couple minutes. Uh, do we like that? I think we do. Make another layer. When we get to the end, the overall image will get more and more balanced. So now let's get on to the interesting part. Let's make a selection on this really bright area. That's the real area of interest. So I'm gonna make a nice large selection. Then I'm gonna narrow it down and make a couple more. And selection, modify, feather. Let's do 400 pixels. Hide the marching ants. Now watch what happens. And you can see this is heavily influenced by hydrogen alpha. Now if we were to done the whole image, we wouldn't see such a dramatic change in that center area, but by selecting the center area and feathering it out, we can now balance that area and watch what happens. Here we have the red, bring it down, bring it out. Get rid of this overwhelming green. Whoa. Now that's a change as opposed to this green nebula. Now all of a sudden we see a nice variety of color in the area of real interest. So let me make another copy of that layer. And now let me just select this really green area down here. Don't worry about my jiggling mouse. Not important. And let's feather that selection. I don't think we need 400 pixels on that. Let's just to say 250 pixels. Hide the marching ants. Go in and adjust the levels. And again, we're always trying to overlap these three channels so that the overlap looks kind of gray. Eh. And that's a change. Now I could go into smaller areas and define a little bit more here. Let me just do one on the same layer. So let's, let's say I wanted to bring out more of the variation on just this one area here. I could do that. Let's just make that selection. And let's do the same thing. Let's include it with this area right here. 
And again, all we're doing is the same thing you do for any kind of Hubble palette image is that we're balancing, I think I missed, we're balancing the R, G, and B, which means we're balancing the contribution of the three emissions. Selection, modify, feather, let's feather this one only 100 pixels. It's a small area. Hide the marching ants. Uh, do I like that better? Yeah, I think it's all right. So now let me just step through this step by step here. See what a dramatic change we've made. Here's our starting image. We go with the darker areas first. Each time we're getting more and more variation in color until our final image. Now we're going to do one more thing here. There is an adjustment made by a fellow by the name of Bob Frankie, and there's a link to his adjustment, which I gave Molly, if you want to post that. And I have reduced that to an action. By the way, see how nice overlapped all the colors are pretty much? So we have that's the histogram by doing it one small area at a time. So now let's do the Bob Frankie adjustment. And I have this over here as calling it the tone map adjustment. Uh, let's make another layer here. And now let's do the Bob Frankie adjustment. This brings out a little more, a little more orange. And eh, not much more. And this is our tone map. Now, every time you go through this, oh, there's one more thing we should cover. And that is, you should always select your profile. There's a couple of different profiles that I generally use. One is called the sRGB 1966. And the other one's the Adobe RGB 1998. The 98 is a little more dramatic. So you should always select your profile. If you don't put out a profile with your image, then it's going to be whatever profiles on the monitor that the people are displaying it. So here's our, our final tone map. Now all we have to do is, is put in stars. We're not going to really do that, except I'll kind of blink it in. Ah, we got stars. That'll be another presentation. So that's multi-level tone mapping. And you can see the posted image, which I put in a little more orange. Uh, Molly, you want to post that? out on on YouTube. Yep, got it. 